Hello and welcome to the skating lesson. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Beyer. And if only we had a wonderful Olympic medalist to join us today. Oh, wait, we do. Yes. <laughs> yes, Elena, welcome back to the skating lesson. And there is a lot going on in Russian yeah. hair skating over the last two days. So we thought yeah. who better uh, to talk about this than you. So yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for like him. Thank you for having me. Yes. <laughs> um, so yesterday the news broke that Boykova and Kozlovsky are leaving uh, Tamara Moskvina for a Terry Tuberidza. They're leaving St. <laughs> Petersburg and going to Moscow. Were you as surprised as everyone else? No. I knew something was coming. I knew it for a couple of years, actually for two and a half years, basically the talks were always there, that there was something going on. And I completely understand because Bakov and Kozlovsky were number one in Tamara's group. And then this young couple comes in and they're good. And all of a sudden they're ahead of them. So obviously there was a tension and constant competition. So, you know, I thought about it many times and I knew and I felt how they felt. I knew exactly how they felt because, you know, I lived that life with Mishkotonik and Dmitry back in the day, different circumstances, but I can relate in a way. But mm -hmm. it, I was never thinking, even dreaming about leaving to America because, you know, obviously she's the best out there. But mm -hmm. I was hurt. I was like, what? This cannot be true. And then, of course, five minutes later, it was confirmed by everyone. So it was not a joke. Mm -hmm. But it did not come as a surprise. Absolutely not. I just didn't know. You know, funny thing is one of the guys at a rink, he's a pair skater for United States. And we talked about it because we heard some rumors and we thought that maybe they switched to Nina Moser. So that's what we talked about, but I never thought that we're going to switch to a Terry. That's, that's the thing. So that's, that's the reality. I was a little surprised only because this last season, they were the number one team for Tamara. Uh, if yeah. you think about it, they yeah. won both uh, the Russian nationals and the final. So it seemed like this was helping them. They also have a quad throw and a quad yeah. twist. So yeah. it looks like everything, what would you think they would be moving for in that sense? Because they have the elements and they've been having the ranking this season. Well, they were amazing. I was actually impressed the way they looked and Alexandra herself looked absolutely fabulous. I mean, it was like a perfect pair skater look, tight, lean, green fighting machine, you know? And yes, I agree towards the end of the season, they were the best out there, period, in the mm -hmm. world, that would say. I think leading into next season, I think expectations are going to be huge because people are going to expect something super new and different from them. But how much more can you develop? I mean, they are at the top of the game, lifts are developed, everything's developed in the programs, they're keeping the programs, nothing's going to be new there. So, but I think what their way of thinking is they want to be number one. And I think at this point of their career, they need that. They need to feel that freedom of we are the only ones. And maybe that will help them to become completely 100% consistent because sometimes they struggle with the throw jumps. It's, um, I mean, it's not 100%. Lots. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. Kind of strange technique when she holds on to him for too long and then it kind of goes from there. But I think in my mind, I think what they're looking for is the leadership. They need to be ahead of everybody and they need to feel that they are number one. And maybe that will help them with their confidence, with like complete confidence. And then they will be completely unbeatable in the field. Because right now, technically, I think the only couple that they will really still compete with is Michelin and Galam. Because I think Taras and Marozov are kind of phasing out. That's just my opinion. Because this season, they were not that great. And, you know, the truth is, they are getting tired. Obviously, they've been around for such a long time. There's no way you can compete at the level that you've been for so many years. So it will be super interesting to see which school wins. And it's mm -hmm. going to add to competition a lot because, you know, Tamara is ambitious and the Terry mm -hmm. is super ambitious. And it will be interesting to see which couple, which school prepares better and which couple is stronger mentally, not maybe so much physically, but like I said, it's going to be amazing to watch what happens. And with the existing tension in the group, a Tamara's group, I think it's going to help Mishnah and Galamov to feel maybe a little bit more relaxed and feel less mm -hmm. tension. Because I think obviously there was tension in the team, which is never a good thing. You know, we'll I live that life. 
And to be honest with you, we managed without much tension because Tamara is, a, she's great with strategy. And knowing her for so many years, she doesn't favor. She's always super careful with what she does. It's always 50-50, no matter what. And I think at this point, the tension was so hard, so heavy in the group that I think everyone in Tamara's group might feel a little bit more relieved than relaxed. Not relaxed, kind of, we don't have to train anymore, but now we can train without super pressure and negative energy in the group. And I think for Boykov and Kozlovsky, it's going to be fresh breath of air, and that will help them to feel like, okay, now we're number one. Now we have this awesome team of coaches behind us. Let's see what we can do. You know, I think in both ways, it's going to be helpful for both teams. That's, no, that's just my opinion. How, what's your impression on how involved Terry is with the pair skating? Because she does have Pavel Slusharenko, who seems to really be the head pair coach. And he has a team with uh, Alexei Tikhanov and um, as well as, uh, you know, Maxim Trankov and other coaches. Yeah. Who, so, as well as Terry, Daniil, uh, Sergei Dudikov. So how involved do you think Terry even is in Moscow? Well, I think she's the headmaster. She's like the organizing committee of the whole thing. And mm -hmm. she's awesome. I think she's, she's strateg her strategy is great. She understands the sport. She understands what it takes to train, how much training needs to be done, how mm -hmm. much discipline is involved in this process. And I think she keeps it all together. She tells everyone, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. And as a, the half person in the whole team, I think, her involvement is 100% in a way that she is just the administrative person. And I'm sure she coaches them, maybe not so much uh, throws and lifts and stuff, but jumps probably. She helps a lot with jumps and consistency. Like do it 50 times, do it 100 times. You mess up, you start over, you do 50, you do 60. I think that's her role. And overall, I think like a psychologist kind of role, talking to them, psychologically making them stronger, but at the same time, Tamara does the same exact thing. So right. it's, I mean, it's the same thing. It's just for Boykova and Kozlovsky, it might be, like I said, uh, fresh air because the team over Terry is a little bit younger overall. And Tamara's team, because Tamara is definitely not that young, but she's super wise and super experienced. But I think that's how Terry is involved. That's just my opinion. She plans, plans competitions, plans how much work has to be done. And she supervises. That's super important because you need to have that person who holds it together, like a glue it together. You know, I think that's, that's mostly, just in my opinion, her role in this. But I don't think how much she knows about lifts. And I'm sure she knows enough to develop, basically develop something or say, the death spiral, the head needs to be lower or the grip on the lift needs to be changed quicker. The rotations of the guy need to be cleaner. So I'm sure she knows all those things. And as for throws, obviously throws and jumps have the same concept, take off rotation position and landing. There's not much really to invent. So, but like I said, overall, I think she is the head of the whole thing. Yeah. I'm intrigued because, in, for instance, in the singles discipline, it seems like Atari and her camp are very set on pushing technical boundaries. And in the recent interview that uh, Boykova and Kozlovsky gave, they were saying, we're tired of this same technical content this whole time. In your experience, what was, what was tomorrow's approach to pushing that kind of technical content? Because on the outside, what I like about Tamara is she seems very centered and grounded mm -hmm. and perhaps more focused on quality over quantity, where perhaps on the outside, in my opinion, it would appear sometimes the Atari camp is more interested in the quantity, perhaps at the cost of the quality. So did you find she was a bit more conservative with pushing the technical limit or did she enjoy testing out those things? No, it was a, it's a balance of things, you know, but for myself specifically, when I started skating with Dennis, I only had double axle and Tamara said, you must learn a triple jump. So that was pushing me above my limits because at 21, you know, you're going to like, yeah, pff, right, uh -huh, triple. And she gave me four months and she said, you needed a triple toll or triple salka. So that was pushing me to the next level. But in most cases, I think for Tamara, we were pushed towards inventive elements like cool lifts and uh, entrances and dismounts and stuff like that. And for me actually to learn throw triple toll loop was a new challenge 
And as for like let's say Mishkutonic and Dmitriev, they had so many unique elements. And that's I think that was Tamara's thing to create something new, not necessarily a quadruple salka or something like that initially when I skated. But if you really look at the history, even with Barish Nice, you can that they were working on quadruple salka, throw salka. And I think they tried a quad twist. I mean, Tamara is inventive, of course, and she likes the technical content. But again, if you really look at the reality of the situation with IGS, you skate a clean, perfect program with, yes, difficult elements, but not like, of course, great if you do side by side triple lots, but if you fall on that jump, if your consistency is not 99.9%, .9%, what are you going to get? You know, you fall, you out. So, yes, no Tamara, cleanness, beautiful extensions, lines overall very high quality of everything you do and you can see this through all her pair teams mm -hmm. with a terry yes yeah, she definitely pushes the limits in every possible way which is just the way she is she's younger she's from different generation she's super brave which is awesome for these days of figure skating obviously everybody's trying to do that but if you compare i agree with you 100 percent. yes tamara is the difficulty but quality you know quality mm -hmm. comes first consistent yeah. because if you're not consistent if your element is not ready and it's in your program you go into competition and you know you you might not be able to do it because if you do only five out of ten the chances you're going to get that five that you cannot do at competition those chances are much higher versus oh i'm going to get lucky and land it mm -hmm. so i i completely agree but i think for boykova and kozlovsky look at them they got quadruple throw right they can do quadruple twist it's amazing it's amazing and it's awesome that they actually wanted to do this and i'm sure tamara encouraged them to do this but at the competition the competition situations they didn't do it as many as many times and i think with a terry pushing that aspect i think they're going to be able to do all those cool things you know that will be absolutely awesome to see a quadruple throw and quadruple twist in one routine and the awesome jumpers. If they throw triple lots in there, side by side triple lots, that will be amazing. Or do a side by side flip. You know, do they do side by side flip lots. We know we've seen them do loop this year, but only in the yes. short program. They yes. did sal and toe. We saw Mishina Galyamov do lots. Do you know if they could do all their jumps? Yeah. I don't know, but it looks like Boykov and Kozlovsky are capable of awesome technique. And I think with the Terry working with them, they're probably going to spend a lot of time working on jumps and. I can tell you for sure, probably uh, triple flip will be no problem for both of them. Lots, I don't know. I cannot judge that. I don't know their capability. But looking at their loop, it looks like flip could be a piece of cake for them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. maybe even difficult, more difficult combinations or sequences, you know. But like if you, let's say you do side by side, triple flip, double axle, double axle, that's already extra points. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure they're capable of doing that, taking that next step with all that technical team that they will have maybe dudakov will get involved maybe Terry herself will teach them that and it's not just teaching that it's training that to an extent that it's 100 percent consistent mm -hmm. you know i'll be curious if it's a decision they regret later on or they're positive about later on just because that competition in masvina's group doesn't even just come from nisha galyamov they have the younger team as well oh, yeah. And perhaps yeah. teams beyond that, and they're all doing those triples and quads and having that competition every day obviously is so motivating. Yeah. You know, the only time can tell. Even my yeah. husband was talking about this morning because he's super involved because, you know, he supports me on everything and he loves Tamara because I love her so much. And we talked about it and he said, Elena, only time will tell. Just right. a few months, just a few months. And only competition will tell when they get head to head, when mm -hmm. they're doing face to face, at one of the events, Russia or international, doesn't matter. That's when you can see the difference because like we talked about Tarasov and Morozov, mm -hmm. they didn't get awesome right away. It took them a long time. And the only time that they really looked at their best was lucky for them at the Olympics. And that was an amazing performance and they got rewarded immediately because I watched and I was like, wow, that was good. They fully deserved silver medals. They actually deserve gold medals, but it didn't take them overnight. It took them time, years consistency, confidence, self-confidence specifically, you know, they struggle with that the most. So it will be only time, like I said, only time will tell. And I cannot wait to watch the competitions. Plus over summertime, who knows what changes are going to happen? Who knows what Taras Van Maroza is going to do? Because now that she's married and 
things a little bit different. And obviously watching them through this season, they struggle a lot, a lot, because they're probably tired. Like I said, when I remember when I was phasing out, it was hard. You cannot keep up. You, If you're at this age, you can't really keep up with 18 year olds because they are full of energy. They're like gazelles. You know, you look at them, they jump, they sprint, they go, they go. Many times when you're older, you, you're afraid to get injured. And if you do get injured, it takes forever to get better. And then there's a fear of getting injured again. So we'll see. Like I said, I wish them all best of luck. And I'm, I know how stressed I am watching the competitions already when Tamara had both of the teams. I was just like, ah, ooh, the throw, oh, oh, you know, watching emotionally. And now it's going to be even worse because, well, sure enough, I want Tamara's teams to be the best because this is my loyalty. But at the same time, I cannot say I'm against Vykova and Kozlovsky. There's different times in figure skating and life in the world. We are all allowed to do what we want to do, what we feel is best for us. I mean, it would be funny if Russian Federation said, no, you cannot switch. That was my days. That was back like late 80s and early 90s when you want to switch. No, you can't switch. And if you switch, if you try, you're in trouble. We're not going to support this. But these days, everybody has the right to do so. And Tamara and I talked and, you know, she's always been very smart and wise about this and she always says right away look if you are dissatisfied if you're not happy let's not play games let's just say let's get together figure out what's going on champagne flowers and thank you that's all we're done that's it and it's a russian tradition you know for everything you do champagne has to be at least in our group it was always champagne <laughs> you know? be nice say thank you don't end on a negative note and that's exactly what happened with Boykov and Kozlovsky I think we all knew and they knew what was coming and uh they ended on the positive note thank you so much you did so much for us but we want to do something else and that's it nobody's upset maybe deep inside of course Tamara probably is hurt but mm -hmm. her behavior her the way she talks, the way she presents herself, it's a wisdom of a grown person. But what are you gonna do? I mean, they wanna go, you're gonna try to keep them? That will never work. We know it's, it will cause the opposite effect. I hate you, I don't wanna be here and I'm gonna sabotage everything we do. So I think everybody should be really calm and happy about the situation because hopefully everyone will gain something positive from it. Tamara's team will, basically gain calmness and everybody can relax there's no more tension and Boykov and Kozlovsky will gain what they want they want this push us we're gonna do more we're gonna do this we're gonna do that and we'll see what happens well it's interesting uh, sorry Dave I didn't mean to jump on that <clears throat> since you brought up the 80s uh Dave and I have had these conversations where we have seen skaters that when they are around other elite competitors they all kind of skate up that yeah. each each training session is almost a competition within itself. And we've seen so many people thrive in those situations. But Dave, I will always remember you interviewing Karen Kadavy uh -huh. when she was like having my competitors on the training session in Jill or whoever was around at the time. She was like, it was a nightmare. Uh -huh. I absolutely hated it. And I would imagine it's person to person whether that kind of constant competition inspires you or it is just exhausting, that there's no time to just do the training, it's always a competition. Did you find it was always competitive for you or did you find that you skated up as a result of being around your competitors all the time? It's a, it's a combination of things. Of course, we always skated, well, younger, younger. Valova Vasily were the idols. And uh, me and my, my ex-partner, we both knew there's no way we can get near that just because they were perfect. Mm. So we kind of sucked it up. We worked really hard, did what we could. And then, you know, I switched to skating with Dennis and Mish Kutyonik and Dmitry were already there. At the beginning, they were there ahead of us. And yes, we wanted to catch up with them, not maybe technically, but time-wise, because we didn't have as much time together. So beginning was, okay, we're going to try to do this, this, and that. My jumps were not as good. Natalia was great with her jumps and it was easier for them because, you know, they were better jumpers. But as we approached higher level competitions, for me personally, it was not happy. I, mm -hmm. I suffered. And now that I'm my age, I look back at it thinking, you should not have done that. You should have used this experience 
to push yourself to do more to do better instead of stressing over oh, she just landed side by side triple toe and i cannot do this i just fell on that relax and they just skated clean program you know i remember one specific episode tamara was away she was there somewhere with something else and she gave us all a plan and said so this day you both have to come back and you skate your long program today full run through which for russians back in the day was like wow we cannot do this now it's <laughs> norm so they went first and I'm watching them and feeling like I'm defeated with each element they do because they were this and that and they had everything was perfect. And Dennis and I skated, so I didn't do my triple toe loop and I forgot what else happened. And I was so upset, not even with myself, but with the fact that they did better. So when mm -hmm. Tamara comes back, we had this discussion, I was upset. And she told me very clearly, focus on yourself. You know, what they do is none of your business. Mm -hmm. do what you can to make yourself stronger and better and i remember this as if it was yesterday because it was like an eye opener wow this is really the truth i cannot control her side by side triple toe but what i can do i can do 50 more myself and then obviously i will do better you know mm -hmm. but yes for me it was a nightmare for dennis i don't think he cared he mm -hmm. was just more laid back okay well that's good well Plus, he, he could sit on the boards for 20 minutes watching me doing double axle, double axle, triple toe, triple toe. All right, you're ready, ready. Side by side once. He's like, I'm done. For me, <laughs> oh, I need to do 50 of those side by side. And for him, it was like, why? I don't need 50. I can do just one. <laughs> and it's true. Yeah. Because jumps came easy to him. For me, it was more work. Do you, you, know, but do you think it would have been different had you been sort of the elite team at your rink? Like if Mishkichanak and Dmitriev had been, let's say, in Moscow and you were the only pair in St. Petersburg, do you think the result would have been different in any way for you? Possibly because I would not be stressed over stupid things. You know, I would be more focused on my training, my listening to my coaches, trusting them undividedly 100%. Because mm -hmm. like with Boykova and Kozlovsky, I guarantee you when uh, Mishina Galamov came in, the trust to coaches was a little shaken because there's always in the back of your head, what if, what if she does something? What if she says something to them that will make them better and stronger? What if she does better programs? I lived through that because yes, of course, even with Ms. Kutonik and Dmitry, a couple of times I felt like, oh, her, their programs are better. No wonder they're ahead of us, which was not true. Tamara was trying to choose wisely for each pair and see what works, what doesn't. Sometimes experiments worked and sometimes they failed. So, you know, but yes, um, and that's just me thinking back years ago. Yes, if there was less stress uh, in basically the towards direction, I'm not the best, I'm not number one, maybe. But again, there's no guarantee. Maybe I would have found something else to worry about instead of focusing on my training, you know? <laughs> yeah. Something else to dig into, who knows? <laughs> The brain, you never know what it's going to think. <laughs> you know, there's, there's one other factor here that I think that um, is a little bit uh, interesting is that, you know, it was a post-Olympic season. So there's usually a lull for athletes and something to really struggle with. You know, a lot of athletes go through a depression after the Olympics. And they don't necessarily, whether they're competing or not. She was able to work through that with both teams and keep them improving. And actually we saw them all try harder elements that actually kept them interested, motivated, and engaged. Mm -hmm. And Laura did this and perhaps was the only coach in Russia to really keep her athletes moving forward when they are banned from international competitions, right? So those two factors I think are huge yep. and her teams improved yep. during this time more than anyone else in Russia. Everyone was talking about the Russian pairs this season. Yes, so absolutely. Have you talked to Tamara about how she's kept everyone motivated during this time? Because being at an international competition is like a death to motivation. I don't know how you would stay so sharp as an athlete, especially when you're old enough to know better. Well, first of all, she works with mature professional athletes. Those, those are not kids. They know mm -hmm. what they want. And they know they want to go to the next Olympics because mature is kind. I mean, we did see yeah. Boykova throw her credential yeah. at Mara. She just means older. She sure. just means older. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I think it would be different if you if you yeah. are in your twenties as opposed to yeah. in your mid teens. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but I think Tamara has a really good wisdom about training and how to talk to her athletes and set up goals, attainable goals, one step at a time. So here's what we need to do. 
and here's what the program we need to do. Let's try something different because I've heard a lot of controversial comments on uh, Mission Agalamov long program. I personally loved it. I laughed. I, I I clapped. I was. I mean, it was crazy. It was insane, but it was something different. And his red outfit. Oh, I've heard comments about that. But you know what? I think it was cool. Yeah, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. But I think it was really amazing that he actually put it on. <laughs> <Tried to get laughs> A six feet, six feet three or whatever he is to put the red outfit on. That's pretty insane. And they did a great job. So I think what Tamara is way of convincing her skaters and talking to them and setting up goals and the training process itself is not stressful. It's just one step at a time. And I think she is, her strategic planning is awesome. Just for what I remember. And I think that's why she kept her athletes improving which we looked at, if you look at Tarasov and Morozov, they could not sustain all that pressure of, okay, now what? Because they reached their goal and like, it's so hard to continue going at that rate because you know you have to do three run-throughs a week, probably a long program of five or whatever. And it's hard mentally, maybe not so much physically, but mentally your brain says, oh, I cannot do this, I'm tired. I don't want to do this. And, you know, they probably had a taste of, a real life she got married and they probably had actually time to relax and have some vacation times and just get rid of that anxiety over oh my god olympics all this or that you know and it's hard look at the single skaters how many survived in russia after the olympics i mean even girls how many who actually went to the olympics well elizabeth you know elizaveta tuktik she was actually improving i think in a way but some other girls could not sustain all that pressure, got injured, had surgeries or something, something. You know, it, it, it's just in Tamara's defense and me just loving her so much and admiring her for her skills. I think she's just the best with talking and convincing. And the fact that her athletes, I think, well, like we said, they're mature, hopefully. And maybe after Baikova had a couple of fits and through, through a couple of tantrum tantrums that happens, I did it myself, but maybe not in front of millions of people, but, you know, we kept it contained within the team. <laughs> so maybe they're maturing. And actually the fact that they actually finally said we are ready to switch shows that they actually mature enough and basically strong enough to say, okay, we got to do this, you know? And actually part of the problem, I think not even the problem, but part of the issue is that if you look at dance couples recently in Russia, how many just switched coaches abruptly, like Stepanova and Bukin, that was a shocker for the whole world because they were with their coaches for 13 years. And imagine how much pain they put their coaches through when they came over and say, well, here's the flowers and we're going to move to Julen, which is, okay, understandable. They want something new, something different. I think these kind of things open the door for others to say, okay, if they did it, we can do it. And, you know, what would it have to lose? You don't know what's going to happen. Even if they skate worse next year and they misunderstood and the programs are not as good, you got to try it. If you don't ask, the answer is always going to be no. And I think everyone who is switching coaches, either it's right or wrong, whatever reason behind it, they're trying. They're moving forward one way or the other. It's, it's a movement forward, not backwards. Well, and it's interesting, in the United yeah. States or in other places, we see skaters changing coaches. Yeah, all the often. time. And is this sort of steeped from, again, like sort of more that like Soviet era training system where they were like, you're with your coach, end of story. Yeah. So it's still relatively a new concept. Anytime there's a coaching change in Russia, it's enormous news. Yeah. Is yeah, well, my, yeah, exactly. I don't know why, because in Russia, well, because we're known as a conservative country. And the history looks like before you're with one coach, heaven forbid if you try, like I said, you couldn't even think that. With time, we were allowed, but it was really not that easy anyways, because Federation would look very thoroughly through why, give us some good reasons. And if they thought it was, yeah, sure, okay, let's give it a try. And if the switch was reasonable, yes. And these days, it's still a big deal. It's still a huge explosion. I remember when Jason Brown switched coaches, it, it was such a shocker to me. I couldn't mm. believe that he left his coach for Canadian team, but now I see why. I see right. why. There was a new environment, new development of events, new technique, new, he became even better with the change. 
So for the most, change works for the best. But mm -hmm. like I said, we'll see because it's, it's, you have to try it. If you don't try, you're always going to stay where you're at. But the only sad thing that basically I gather from Tamara that Boykova and Kozlovsky are so awesome right now. They're like at top of the game and that's when they left. Yeah. And I think all that work that was, put, that was put into them and them working themselves so hard and actually being very ambitious to get those two difficult elements. Mm -hmm. And it almost to me, it feels like they got there and that's time to switch. You know, if they want the process of, okay, something is not working out, we need to try to change, we'll see what happens. Maybe that coach will help us to get to our goals. But they're there, they're the best. And that's when they oh, left. Oh, Elena, yeah. this is so good for us because you don't think a Terry could make a comment slighting Tamara if she gets oh. them to land these difficult elements, you know, this season, but they've already done them in the shows, but you know, you know how that works when you first move and you honeymoon and you're being- Six weeks. Six weeks. I go through this all the time with students at the rink. The yes. best behavior. And then, okay, we are where we belong. We're exactly where they're supposed yeah. to be. And they, the honeymoon is over and they're... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's normal. It's normal. But the thing is, I was going to say, a while back, Terry made very clear comments towards Tamara. Mm -hmm. And basically, she was stating that their skating is boring. And obviously it was a poke towards Tamara because Tamara had the best pair teams and it was basically proposed that we're stuck. Pair teams need something new. They need more difficult jumps and this, this and the other. And of course they focus on the pair elements. They need more time on singles elements. And I just read it the other day because I was Googling a lot of things thinking, is this true? What's happening at Terry? You know, and then, even then, when I saw those comments a couple of years ago, I was like, whoa, this is not good because I protect Tamara till the day I die, you know, because she's <laughs> the out there. And to me, it was like, wow, that's almost like a slap on the face. And then next season, Tamara had two pair teams who were awesome and they were beating Taras and Morozov. And only at the Olympics, I believe, things really, really regrouped and changed for Taras and Morozov actually skating the performance of their lives and getting up there. And then I felt like, okay, well, maybe Tamara is not as bad. You know, maybe her strategies and her programs and her sixth sense of what works is perfect. You know, and yes, I completely happy that Boykov and Kozlovsky left Tamara at the top of the game. So how much more can you invent? They already have two key elements. Well, like I said, maybe jumps. And I agree. Yes, jumps could be put to the next level. Triple lots, triple flip. I'm sure there will be no triple axel, but... You know, you can still tweak the combinations. You can still do a lot of cool things with combinations. You can, example, think for it this way, triple flip or the triple cell count. That's like, wow, you know, that will be woof number of points. But is it reasonable? Is it consistent? Because watching Tamara's teams doing cell count, Euler cell count, how many times you see that Euler chewed up in the middle and thinking, how is that triple cell just, you know, transpired from that kind of Euler? So, you know, again, play the game. Is it reasonable? Is it going to work for them? What if she falls? What if he falls? Consistency is the key. The level of confidence. Do many competitions or exhibitions doing those elements and make sure you're not completely out of your mind stressed going into it thinking this one element because yeah, okay, maybe you land it, but then after that, you're the whole program is still ahead of you and you can make other mistakes like miss a lift. Don't go up on the lift, fall on a throw. You never know. It has to be a perfect execution of the whole program. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Well, they do have an opening now in Tamara's group. So uh -huh. what do you think about Alyana Kosternaya in pairs? Do you think that this would be someone that Tamara could handle? You know, you say that she's a psychologist, yeah. that she is so wise. And we know that Alyana Kosternaya has a lot of temperament and she seems yeah. to have a lot of character. You know, I think that this could be an opening for uh, Tamara. I thought about it too. Yeah, that would be a great opportunity <laughs> for Tamara to take someone and say, okay, this is what I actually can do. This is what my yes. team can do. Let's do it. But will they do it? Because now everybody knows, oh, there's an opening. And Tamara and Minchuk, they will take. They will take because why not? Obviously, they're a successful team of coaches. And yes, that would be interesting to see. And as for difficult students, Tamara can actually clearly for two and a half years, she handled 
Boykova and Kozlovsky. And how many years did she handle Elena Betschke for? That I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> even, today, even today, if you ask Tamir, she will tell everyone Elena was the most difficult student she ever had. <laughs> but she handled me. Yeah, it was not easy at times. We fought, we struggled, I screamed and yelled and cried and you name it. I was dramatic about a lot of things, but her patience, her wisdom, her love, mostly for her love for me as a person, I think did the trick. Because Tamara is not kind of a person who would say, okay, I'm done with you, go. Because she somehow believed in me. She knew that the day will come with all that hard work, because I worked super hard, all the training and psychological, because I worked with psychologists permanently the Olympic year. She believed that one day it will happen. And even at the Olympics in 1992, okay, let's look at the truth. Mish Kuchonik and Vitu skated beautifully, but they messed up both of their jumps. So all I had to do, land my clean triple toe, one foot, perfect landing, and throw the double axel in. And things could have been completely different. You know, everybody knows that. I was questioned on that multiple times. Okay, triple toe was two foot, and Scott Hamilton said, oh, she should be happy with this, because he knew the history of Elena Betschke. You know, for me, that was like, oh, my God, I actually, on my two feet, you know, and I'm going. And right away, decision was made, no double axel, because mm -hmm. what if I fell? And then we would be third, you know, but the goal was triple toe, even like this, the way it was, move on, clean skate, enjoy, emotional run through, give it all. And we did, you know, but even today, people ask me this question, what if, why didn't you do that double axel? Well, because the plan was made, we trusted Tamara, and this is exactly what we did. We did what she said. You know, and it worked. Yes. Knowing the triple toe was not perfect already. Throwing double axel in. What if it was not perfect either? What would have happened? You know, I would be more so like Isabella and Lloyd making mistake after mistake after mistake instead of skating a clean run through and, you know, getting a silver medal, which was to me, I mean, it was the biggest accomplishment in my life back then because who believed in me other than my coach, my, my beloved Tamara? Tamarichka. How many times were you second at the World Pro? Uh, well, yes. You know, we <laughs> it took us years, right? We won yes. in 1996 and we fully deserved that. But then how many times we didn't get it for mm. many different circumstances? You know, that's, sometimes circumstances were just weird. You know, I can name a few. And even the very last one that Dennis and I, we thought we won, because mm -hmm. we saw the marks and the PR team after us did not skate clean. They are about to take the interview. Oh, they, they win because we won the long, but then when they calculated the all together, oh, they're second, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was like one of those, oh, okay. I, bet, I was watching that last one that you skated. I did my melatonin viewing, you know, before you go to bed, <laughs> you put on. And it was a beautiful program, Elena and Dennis. And the music is so familiar. It's the same music that Mishin and Galyamov used at the Olympics. Yes, and Valova and Vasiliev. So, you know, I always, <laughs> well, I always wanted to skate to that music when Elena and Oleg skated and they were part of the Olympics and that's they won their, their last world championships. If you remember, yellow outfits, yellow and black. That was the music. It's a very popular wait, Russian. Wait, wait, but it was mixed with the final countdown <laughs> from Rocky. Yes. Right? yes. <laughs> well, it made a perfect sense for them. That was an amazing routine. I mean, crazy to say it, but it was an amazing winning mm -hmm. final performance for them. And I watched that program every session because we always skated together and they did what they did, but I always wanted to skate to it. And when we were basically coming towards the end of our career with Dennis and I, and we skated in Austria, Oleg Vasiliev was one of the judges and we skated that program. I mean, I think either there or some other competition. I told him, I always wanted to skate to this. You know, it's like it was my dream come true. You know, and that we will love that music and Tamara loves the music. And it's like I said, it's one of the most famous recognizable pieces of music in Russia. That's why a lot of skaters it's like to- music or something, right? Like it was, that is that what they it's mixed? It, yeah. We didn't mix it with anything. We took four yeah. and a half minutes of that song. Maybe okay. didn't okay. even cut it at all. For us, it was like a adagio kind of routine. But for other teams, it's a part. No one ever dared to skate to the whole thing, the whole thing, because it does develop. But for amateur competitions, it wouldn't develop enough. It has to have ups and downs. This one was 
for us, it was perfect because we had a lot of adagio lifts and basically think about one throw, one jump. What do you do for the rest? You do adagio stuff. You do spirals. You do some cool elements. So it worked for us just the way the piece was designed. And what did so. you, what do you think of Kosternaya so far in Paris? Are you impressed? Like, what is your take? Obviously she's switching. I thought when they did their performance, it looked kind of slow and smaller, but what should we be expecting, you know, for this kind of transition? Well, it was the logical development for her. She's a perfect type for pair skating. She is a firecracker. She's mm -hmm. got the, she's very brave. She does, mm -hmm. she's not afraid of trying new things. And I think with correct coaching, with guidance, with a good coaching team, I think they have a very bright future. And I think her partner, at some point skated with Tamara's team, I think. Maybe I read it wrong, but I think he was with Tamara at some point. So I think with good guidance and training, they can develop. Right now, there's no style, obviously, because it takes years to develop a style. Just because you put two good skaters together doesn't mean as a pair, there's wow style. They will need to find good music, good programs, someone who could see that long-term where they're headed and develop that. So I, I guarantee you they can develop into a very good pair team eventually because what's there not to do? I mean, jumps are good, well, hers. I don't know about his ability because of that run through, I think he popped his He flip. popped, yeah. But for her, it's like piece of cake. I can do triple lots, triple toe, no sweat. That would be cool to see actually if he can do it because for guys, I think sometimes it's harder because they're taller and you know, it's just obviously more difficult to learn, more difficult jumps with age. But for throws, they can learn triple, throw triple axle probably without any problem and quad easily. You know, lifts, everyone can do a lift, to be honest with you. It's not that difficult. Just pick one and develop it and do it. And I think he is a good pair skater. He's not a single skater, so he knows what he's doing. So I think they have a bright future. And I think her move to pairs was just the logical development. She's not old. She's, what, 19? Well, yes, I started pair skating when I was 12. But with Dennis, I was, I was 21. And I still mm. dared, you know, and of course, I knew pretty much a lot of things about pair skating and it was easy. But even learning with Dennis, you know, because we still we knew each other, we, we skated in the same ice, taken from the same coaches. It was still painful to learn new things. But for her, I think they're going to click quickly and they're going to develop a style and just hopefully they will be with a good team, you know, good team of coaches who can handle her behavior or whatever passion I would call it passion because she's passionate I mean obviously a lot of issues come from love for the sport for me for me personally I was passionate about the sport and I wanted to be perfect and all my drama in my younger years came from I just want to be the best I just want to do it all I couldn't stand mistakes I couldn't stand my failures it was my problem I couldn't deal with controlling things that I couldn't control that was my big issue you know with time I started learning and working with psychologists was the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned the key words key sentences key think this think that stay away from this do not go that way you know and it helped me with professional career tremendously during competitions because we developed a lot through professional career even competing you know because my self-talk was amazing I learned how to self-talk myself out of negative way of thinking it was not like i'm going to miss the triple toll what's going to happen it was more like okay no you can do this don't let them have it because basically when you compete and you mess up because of your thinking you're giving your competitors gifts yeah you know, okay just take my triple cell i don't care you know i'll just I, I fell on that so take that as i grew more psychologically and maturity came in I started thinking different I started thinking I can't do this I will do this and I will not let you have this so mm. my gift to my other competitors basically minimized as I grew wiser I should say you know but I really hope that every pair team that we have will be successful and I cannot wait for next season to come and see what's happening you know because pair skating obviously is my thing and I always watch I even get my husband involved and he sits on the couch and watches every single thing except for dance. I have to admit dance, eh, not so much. because <laughs> I don't understand dance. I do understand Papadakis and Caesar on. I can watch them certain programs 24 seven and mm -hmm. yeah, maybe some other dance couples, but not so much because I don't understand. I understand twizzles. I understand lifts, but 
other than that, beauty, beauty that I understand, beauty and the passion for each other and just what they're trying to say. Sometimes my problem is I don't understand what they're trying to say. I right. mean, I don't want to sit and think, what was that all about? I want to yeah. see a scene from dance. I feel it. I leave it with them. They take mm. me through that process and I get it. Whew. And then I was like, wow, I got that, you know? And, but for my husband, he's a good sport. I tell him all the elements and I can tell. He's like, how do you know what's coming? Because I know what's coming. You know, I can <laughs> tell by the approach, by this and that. I know exactly what's coming. He's like, oh, you're right on the money. Yeah, because I know what I'm saying. <laughs> I know what I see coming. You know, now, with you, but I have to have your wrist. Well, I fell. How? Tell but us the story. Well, the story that was last Wednesday, not this one, last Wednesday. I was sick for two days. I took two days off, which I never do. And I went back on the ice and I felt great. I mean, it was not, I was fogged, not at all. And in my lesson with a little girl who's skating and she's, she messed up a mohawk and I'm blah, 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 behind her back. You can see <laughs> me, I'm approaching her, passing her. And next that I know I'm on the ground and my soft tissue hurts first. <laughs> first thing that touched the ground was the soft tissue. But then the pain from the, from the impact of the hand was just, the guys, I felt like throwing up and, all of it at the same time but what are you gonna do i'm good and then i didn't do anything about it for two days i was like yeah, it's gonna be okay but then it got swollen and the pain was so bad i knew it was something so i went to doctor's office and they did x-rays and they're like well there's a hairline fracture not much we can do it's not bad for the cast so i get this thing and it's getting better. What we do every day now, we did hot cold, we did ibuprofen. They gave me some pills I don't take because I just don't want to deal with a headache after that. So my we do, we hit it up. And then my husband deals with me screaming and crying. And he moves it around because it has to be moved. And then we ice it. So we do this in the morning when I have a break, if I have a break, and at night. This is our routine. And it does get better. It's only been, what, a week and a half. And it's already a little bit better. And I just have to deal with it. I can actually do more because first couple of days, I couldn't do much. I mean, I couldn't use my hand at all. It was really annoying. But now I'm getting better. I just have to remind myself, don't use your hand. Obviously, no push-ups, no dips, no weights work because I, I still run my office classes. So I tell the kids, if you do planks, I'm not participating. If we do push-ups, you're doing them. Now I finally get yeah. to the class, <laughs> you know, so, but I'm okay. I'll be fine. Well, thank you so much. It's always You're so welcome. much fun to talk to you. We love having you on. Thank you thank so much. You, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, now we'll just continue our chatting, Jonathan, because there are lots of little odds and ends this week, but things are starting to happen, but it's... Emphasis on odd. Emphasis on odd. <laughs> really? Why odd? Let it happen. Well, you know, I just, as I read all of these skating articles yes. uh, and all these sorts of stuff, it does seem like it's just another universe of yeah. a, a, just a total different set of values, a different mindset for everyone. Yes. So it, it was an interesting juxtaposition to be reading all these articles where everyone is sort of letting you in on their trauma in a way and in their dysfun the dysfunctional systems within the sport. And then bam, you put that with an Ashley Wagner video that's sort of calling everything out in real time. And I'm yeah. like, that seems like real life to me. And so many of these other things we're reading are so... Yeah, I'm really glad that Ashley spoke out. I had tweeted about that week ago. We discussed it here about the different issues. Although she didn't name Kelsey Parker by name. And I don't know the decision-making for that. And this is often something we see where people talk about something so clearly, but then they don't say the person's name. And obviously it's not their decision to do that. And they're kind of raising attention to an issue, but then by not naming the person, and we've seen this a lot, it's actually going on quite a bit. My thing is that, and it's not up to one person to correct. It's not up to Ashley to correct this situation at all. It's on you as figure skating to correct. Right, this. of course. And the only thing is if you don't name the person, can they then hide? Right, and, and we see this across the board. There's something going on now, a couple of things in Canadian figure skating where everyone is talking about an abusive coach in Vancouver. There are threads about this, it's on Twitter. 
So much so that a former student of the person, the coach that everyone thinks is talking about said something inadvertently insensitive on Twitter, whether they knew it or not. We're like, well, I was never abused. That's such a problematic way to say things. And it's I mean, the rink where Ted is at. So then it's like, what does Ted know? And people are talking about that. And this, yes, it, it is messy. But when you're not naming the person, does it get accountable? I mean, there was a high profile skater where if you're in Twitter or on the boards, you know, there was a skater who was um, accused of sexual assault. And then it's, yes, does Skate Canada know about it? Someone said yes, but if the person is not ever named, how do you investigate, right? Or does it allow someone to get away with not investigating as hard because they don't have the hard facts, right? right? With all of these, and we see how long these investigations take. And to, to Ashley's point, I mean, it took great strength for those yeah. victims to come out against John Coughlin and, and a lot of people just victim shamed the bejesus out of them. Still do, and they still, um, I was getting messages from one person and and she was on Twitter and then she, I blocked her and she was messaging, you know, wanting to victim shame Ashley for all of this, right? That if you fall, if you pass out on someone's bed, I guess it's fine if they, um, you know, like where's the logic? But, and it was a female that was victim shaming her. And we often, unfortunately, you know, people get, uh, it's whatever terrible. Traumas are, you know. And this is just a sidestep and I'm not promoting it for any particular reason other than its relevancy here. There is a play that was on West End and then it came to Broadway and this it's a one woman show and it's an actress who I think will undoubtedly win the Tony. And it's um, it's called, it's a legal term, prima facie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. It starts as a woman who is used to interrogating victims of sexual abuse to undermine their story. Mm -hmm. And in a, I'm not spoiling the story, yeah. but in a turn of events, she becomes the victim of sexual assault and just her journey on how she had treated survivors to then becoming one was this prolific event in her life. And it was all this sort of stuff, but you realize, and then as you watch a show like that, you're like, who actually victim shames? That sounds terrible, I can't believe it. And then I just started thinking about things in skating. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it, we saw it unfold at the highest level in skating, that mm -hmm. it was, everyone was angry at the people that had the strength to speak out and try to change something for the good. It's, you know, it's terrible, these stats on, on survivors regretting even coming mm -hmm. forward because it got so much messier. Yeah, and it was the timing too of that. Um, I think, you know, there was so much going on in the culture when this story broke is that, it, you know, there was the Nasser situation that happened in gymnastics, which really aligned with Me Too, right? Right. When this situation happened, it was actually at the turning point of that because I think everything in society has a pendulum, right? So there was the Believe Survivors movement. And there was the other side that was perhaps angry, you know, because things are really getting upended. And I think that there's an yeah. amount of civil unrest or change to how you view the world that people can accept, right? Whether it's about values or not, right? I think that there's a certain, um, I think that that, and I'm not excusing anyone, right? But I, I think if you're a person that has been lived in this society for so long, for some people, it can make them very uncomfortable to face right. certain things that maybe they don't want to face, right? Correct, correct. Um, and I think as everything starts to upend, you know, can come in and Christine Blasey Ford happened, right? And then this is where people felt more comfortable to speak and this all happened. And I think that that has part of why this story went the way that it did, um, yeah. in addition to, um, uh, you know. And imagine the message uh, being yeah. sent that uh, a victim shamer, a victim, you know, an abuse denier mm -hmm. is now the person in charge of that. That's, yeah. it's horrifying. Right, and then the fact that people will excuse it and say, well, it's, you know, US figure skating is how it is, and it's this and that. No, <laughs> no, why is it how it is? It's, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they, 
have been requested comment on this by more than one person. And my understanding is that you know they didn't get back to me for comment, and they haven't gotten back to um, other people for my under knowledge. And and this is something that started to happen where they just ignored. They started ignoring yeah. stories to make it go away. And I think in some respects, it sort of help it sort of made it like you know Delilah that story didn't go nationally as big as it could have because there aren't as many sports journalists right within right. the current and, and skating's not as relevant but then nothing changes and of course right. that's why your sport is irrelevant so right. anyway um just to real this point I thought that one of the great points she made obviously I don't always agree with the one Ashley Wagner but on this like I, I was lining up with her right away and she was like, you had the opportunity. You mm -hmm. had the opportunity to pave the way, move forward, be progressive, brave mm -hmm. new frontiers in this organization and you just bailed. Mm -hmm. You just you just didn't have the guts to, to do the right thing. And that's yeah. unfortunate. You had the opportunity and didn't take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's so many even other layers that she didn't get into. I mean, you know, this person's husband is now going to be working for Tammy. There's talk that maybe he'll only work with Tammy's international students, but then you're still assisting a main coach in the U.S. And there are still those political um, situations, right? Where I think mean, Tammy stands to become very powerful with all of, of these. Of course, things. between not only between that, but then also this Justin Dillon. I well, mean, Justin this, was her former assistant. Yeah, so it's yes. all yeah. in there. It's it it just and is the status quo what you're looking to maintain? I don't know that the status quo is worth maintaining. I mean, I I don't think that the skaters are winning. Do you? Uh, certainly not or healthy you know what I mean it's just not the right environment and it's just this fear of change and there's a lot of change happening I mean I think we see so much happening in Japan in Korea around the world there's a lot of change happening and I think um quietly I think we're going to see a lot of other countries continue to move forward um the Korean pair split up this week because Stephen Adcock who was kind of the imported uh member of that pair had a back injury but I think oh. we're going to be seeing probably another pair boy you know with this country I think there's a huge opportunity um you know Montreal got another uh Japanese team so it's interesting they went from Tim Coletto having Daisuke as his competitor but Daisuke and Kana retired uh from skating this week on Monday already it seems like a million years ago but right <laughs> whether you thought that was going to happen or not now there's another Japanese team in Montreal. It's just interesting how this is all shifting and very quickly um, the dynamics in the sport. And it does seem like in the absence of Russia, Korea and Japan are really- Rising. Rising. It's yeah. Especially Korea um, with yeah. the, the dance team um, that they have. And we also, we saw Yuma Kagiyama come back um, and start to perform again. We had seen him working figures a little bit on Instagram but he was at nationals, didn't look at top strength, but he's really been a forgotten skater. Uh, and there's been so much, I think, focus on Shoma, but Yuma, one of the top, consistently top skaters in the world over the last several seasons and didn't see him, you know, where do you see him fitting in next year? Uh, I, I think it just all boils down to the health. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing, because we've also heard that Shoma is, is having the ankle issues. Yes. I, I mean, this is this is a big opportunity for Yuma. I missed Yuma, but you are correct. There's so much depth in Japan that Japan was still meddling all over the place in every men's event with with even their sort of like second group of men. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get Kazuki, and we you know we get all these other great performances. Um, I think that I think the judges will welcome him back with open arms. Yeah. I think this is a skater that like that everyone likes. It's easy yeah. to to reward this skating because it is performative. It is excellent technically. There is something engaging about the performance that I think is only going to continue to grow. So I, I'm very much looking forward to his return. I, he I, but I don't, another one that I would send to the cricket club for part time. You know, if Kazuki doesn't want to go, because for me, Yuma, what he's missing, he's the most beautiful technique, right? Mm -hmm. 
is that extra layer of performance. Now he's worked with Lori, uh, but does he need that David Wilson? You know, I think finding the magic for him and finding the music. With, well, I mean, when you say work with Lori, I wish it was like, she was at the rink all the time. I don't, because I don't think that kind of well, thing- Lori doesn't really choreograph on the ice anymore is my understanding of it. And she works with other people. So I don't think she's working in the same way because she's had health concerns. Um, but I know that Carolina Costner has worked with her. That's why they worked with Isabeau. So I don't know if, you know, what that level is of Lori's engagement, but you know, David Wilson still, and it's interesting because Junwa Cha is at the cricket club, but he has worked more with Shay Lin. So mm. if I were Yuma, I would be looking at that David Wilson angle here, right? And, yeah. and bringing but in Sandra, I, right? I mean, what I mean by that is that the, the, these choreographic sort of figures are with you almost all the time. I, I mean, and I think that's where the major change happens we will see a skater say, oh, I'm going to go for these two weeks and work with blah, 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 and then leave and not check in. And I was like, I don't, yes, they can give you a lovely program, but I think a lot of that work must come for the constant refinement, the constant presence of that person with that in mind. Well, and Yuna developed when she was with David that often, right? That's who? Yuna Kim, when she was oh, with David yeah. Wilson as often as she was, that really benefited her. And I would think it's, it needs to be as consistent as the other. It was kind of a secret weapon against Mao is that she developed more into that performer, right? Those, the head gestures, the things oh. that people would ask, why is she beating Mao if, you know, then you go into projection and, and things like that. Um, yeah, I would be, I'm very curious to see how this pans out with Yuma, but I would be, uh, making moves, right? Because, and it's not just about this season. I think Yuma has the potential to win the Olympics in three years, right? So I would be looking at what's going to get him where he needs to go. I think he needs solid triples to keep developing that and to mature a little bit and still have his father as his coaching staff, but probably expand beyond that and mature a little bit and grow. And maybe being against Jun Wa Cha would benefit both of them. To yeah, to but it's interesting, and I'm going to take a side note because I don't know we talk, we planned on discussing this, but the idea that Yuma is the kind of skater with these beautiful skating skills and shows us that he works on figures, yeah. that is such a statement to me, to social media, that this skater takes the craft of skating so seriously. Mm -hmm. Off the heels of the Ilya Malinin story, he posted on Instagram, Mm -hmm. uh, a new entrance to his quad axle. And it was like a counter turn or something like that. And the caption read, working mm -hmm. on my skating skills. Yes. And I think that sends a message that you think doing a turn before your jump it means skating skills. Whereas when Yuma is showing us figures, that's someone who's taking skating skills seriously. Well, so funny is, you know, Ilya's agent, Ari Zakarian, messaged me yesterday to ask me if I'm going to Ice Theater of New York tomorrow. And of course, Ice Theater of New York is honoring <laughs> great skating, you know, Liz Schmidt and, and Daniil and Roheen is there performing This Bitter Earth in that red costume that I Ooh, think- I saw those pictures, yeah, yes. yes. I want to see this, like live yeah. and in person, right? More of this. But of course, they're honoring Jason Brown tomorrow night. And I said, yes, I will be going and you should, invite Ilya and have him come watch Jason. That's what I said yeah. to <laughs> Yeah. Listen, gentle ribbing. You know, I mean, that's... <laughs> um, but yeah, I... Um, I will... Yes, the answer is yes. Yes, just yes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm not encouraged that we're gonna see um, that Ilya's sensitivity training is going to be what is going to... Uh, it's, it's take work, and, you know, and I've actually talked to other coaches about this. You know, this is kind of a Russian viewpoint um, or a viewpoint of certain people that, yes, yeah, certain people just get the components. It's like, no, it takes work. It takes a lot of discipline. Well, and then I, then I, that's what I want to say. Like, are you actually watching Jason skating? Do not understand. Do you really watch it and then not understand why the PCS is what it is? Are you looking at the blades? Are you looking at the knees? Are you looking at all of these things and comparing them side by side? And are you actually still confused? Well, I think it's what people are interested in and how their brain works, right? Like Tim Gable works in mathematics, right? 
could you get Tim to sit down and watch Ice Dance and then ask him to explain what's going He just might not be interested, right? His brain might just work differently. But that's why the sport is so interesting. It has people on all ends of this yeah. spectrum of artistry, right? And you put it together. But someone like that just may not have the patience or the interest to work on that. And we are looking for the well-rounded skater at the end of the day and, and, this, and you can always view it like if if this skater that we're watching wasn't skating what would they be doing and we know that some would be doing mathematics and other like aggressive sports and mm -hmm. we know that others would probably be dancers or actors mm -hmm. i just happen to like when they're both <laughs> yeah. uh, and if you're making me choose one i as an audience member for skating want the dancing performance. Listen, if I weren't into skating, I'd probably have an interest in ballet. <laughs> you know, like I would be uh, doing something exactly. similarly intense, right? Exactly. What do I do when I'm not? I'm doing Pilates and yoga and similar things like that. Other people are not, you know, they're yeah. marathon running or they're doing something else, right? So right. it's, yeah, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, we also saw Sui Wenjing skating on her own. And there have been rumblings that she wants to come back and is trying to get, you know, Han uh, Kong. Ionic woman, yeah, okay. <laughs> to do that, I, I would at least like to see them sing again. We saw them release a song months ago. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting, but I, I would love to see her skate again. I was just interested and appreciate Give her solo dance, put her in our solo dance category. I would watch that. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think that they could come back, save their bodies for time. What's your take on Papadakis and Cizeron? You know, they announced that they're not competing this season. Not a great surprise, but do you think they could come back for the other? I haven't seen anyone develop, right? To where I think they are going to be the Olympic champions, right? To me, this right. team still has something where they could come back. And those teams that really are doing the improving and the rising of the ranks are, are still safely out of the medals slots at the moment. So I, I still, I feel if it's what they wanted to do, they would have no problem sweeping the entire season. I don't, yeah. and we, we saw these clips from the French tour or whatever it was called. Um, and they still just know how to make a moment better than anybody. What yeah. I really liked about seeing this show that they were skating in in France with Kevin and some of the other ice dancers was that tango number where it was- they, yeah. Yes, three couples at once. And I, I just adapting thought- Adapting their Olympic free dance. That was their program that they were adapting and doing it as a group number. Yeah. Loved it. That's the kind of show program that interests me and is intriguing. Mm -hmm. One of my things, because we know I've never really been into the show skating as much as the competitive skating. I just, and I, I don't want to sound pretentious. <laughs> why, why be concerned now? Um, the problem sometimes is literally, as we've talked about production value, a lot of these are just in sort of, and I mean, no offense to wherever this happened. The rinks just look sort of dumpy. There's well, that walls there's over like it looks like billboard advertising everywhere and it just gives it takes away from the gravitas of the performance which i think is profound and deserves a gorgeous background and instead i'm aware we're like in a warehouse with sort of tchotchke um like school dance spotlighting well that's what i yeah because it, it comes down to what is their show schedule and what's it like and what are the opportunities and Everyone is fighting for those shows in Japan and hopefully Korea, right, going forward. But some of these shows are not in great rings. They also, they did artistry on ice. Were they doing holiday on ice? Um, we've, but these are not the same caliber of stage, right? It's not stars on ice. To me, that would be something interesting to do yeah. uh, with a great group of skaters that are motivated and they, they were still doing the competitions. You know, when we see all these shows in Russia, they look kind of cheaply put together. Like, yes, there's a lot of skaters and stuff, but they they look like a joke to me. It's you know, doing... it looks like, oh, we just have to pull this one out real fast. Let's just do it. Yeah, this. let's let's put Swan Lake together for three days and yeah. put it out. And it looks like a joke to me, right? And you see all the different skaters. And I don't find that, I mean, for me, that would be 
the death. Well, as a <laughs> paying audience member, you're a little bit like, did I just pay for the privilege to watch that particular skater? But what am I watching them do here? And again, this is not to detract from the skating that Papadakis and Cicero were doing because the skating was beautiful. Even in the same way when we watched the, the show from Chicago, it mm -hmm. was gorgeously skated. I just wanted more of the feeling of like the Landover World Pro yeah. thing where they, they have done it up. It, it, the space is matching the quality of the performances being given. Well, that's the net result of no one tending to that with the sport, yeah. no one putting the investment in, no one building the sport, no one building it on social media, no one building it in there, not, no one putting the venues. And that's what happens when it's kind of exploited, right? Even yeah. Stars on Ice is less and less time is put into the rehearsal and the crafting and more is just put into letting, to yeah. Right. Yeah. And well, that's what has happened, right? Yeah. And it will take that building. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. That's why to me, I do wonder if I were in their shoes that maybe I would want to come back because you know that you have something physically and intellectually to offer, right? At a certain point. And if there's not a great venue, maybe you do find that new energy to come back, especially because it seems like, you know, they went through a lot of hard times over the last four years. And maybe they would want to say, oh, we're happier, or healthier now. Let's see what we could do. Um, and I think they're the kind of, I view them artists first, athletes second. I, I, mm -hmm. I think they're the kind of artists that aren't necessarily motivated by winning everything. They mm -hmm. won everything. So I, I don't think the idea of another world title is what would ever motivate them to come back. But they have such a point of view, they have such a perspective, and they are such communicators through their skating that I would just think it's providing a larger, grander arena for them to continue to communicate their craft. And you extend your careers, right? You build your profile. Oh, they've <laughs> the biggest on social media. Yeah. This is a world where if you want to make money, you, you know, social media is such a big part of that. We see it with the gymnasts, we see it with Tessa Virtue. So I'll be curious to see what they do in a year, but I would just say that. Year one, we haven't seen anyone come in that could beat them. Right. Year two, let's say in March, you know, yeah. what this is. And I'm sure that they, you know, I originally heard that they were going to kind of take time and, and look um, and we'll see, you know, what happens. But I would, I don't know. They have so, they're still skating so well. And that's. Yeah. And they have so much to say with it. So it wouldn't just be like coming in, just putting together a formulaic program and snatch all the titles. Mm -hmm. I think this is. There is no bigger stage at the moment than something like a world championships or mm -hmm. a Grand Prix final, Europeans, whatever it is. And it's just providing them with a giant stage and an audience to, to do more beautiful things. Mm -hmm. But I, especially after the struggles, I would imagine there's a great deal of burnout. Oh, um, sure. But once that desire comes back to not win, but again, share, mm -hmm. I think they'll do it. No, I was super excited to see Wakaba announce that she is going to compete again and she's performing in shows. I mean, in the fall, it looked like we didn't know if she would compete again. Then she ran a marathon. Now she is back performing, although there aren't videos from this show yet. It's supposed to take like a month for this to be broadcast, I think. But she's going to skate to Coldplay this year, which is a little... Because did we've they, seen did so much... Coldplay? Is it like the fix you, fix me stuff? Yes, I mean, it has paradise. It's like the Shibitani special, I believe. Yeah, that's, um, and again, I like Wakaba in a powerhouse. I, yeah, but listen, she was went through an emotional time. Maybe this spoke to her after the year that she has had. Yeah. Um, it's Fix You in Paradise by Coldplay. Right. It's, yeah, the Shibitani special. So um, <laughs> I'm excited to see her back in the mix. I'm still waiting to see, will we see Rika Kihira skate again? You know, she's been rather yeah. quiet on social media. We don't know what's going to happen there. Um, we did hear that the Valjeva case won't even have a hearing until August. Yeah, okay. So any punishment that she gets, the reality is it's going to be so backdated. I'm just right. warning you now when this happens. So let's say she gets two years. It'll be two years from either that December or that February. Yeah. And again, I wonder if all those skaters in the team event have just disassociated at this point. You have to, to move yeah. forward with your life. Otherwise, you're going to stay angry for what? 
Right. Or stay wondering. Yeah. So, um, as far as Daisuke's retirement, I'm disappointed, but not surprised. I know that they blame his knee in terms of, you know, that it wouldn't allow them to do the training to get better. I knew that training was difficult for them this year to do those full run throughs. He ended in Japan. I would love to see more of him, him skate with Yuzu, do shows together, productions, I think maybe creating other competitions where we could put Papadakis and Scissor on, but I think it's probably the right time for them to make. Yeah, and again, it was interesting, the Marina interview then about it was mm -hmm. that she was like, I think it's importance is that it shows this, this mm -hmm. switching of disciplines can be possible over time. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I hope as Japan has clearly come up with such this powerhouse pair now, mm -hmm. I would love to see I stands take foot there because again, the they could just take every team medal ever if they invest in this dance thing and such an iconic champion like Daisuke mm -hmm. doing it, I hope legitimizes it for younger skaters and sort of encourages more growth in that area, which clearly it has. I mean, there's already a, a team in Montreal now. Yeah, I mean, they did lose some junior teams, but yeah, hopefully they will have success there. We also see Gabby Izzo. There was an article about her switching to pairs. And this has been one of the more interesting ones because she's a taller skater, not the very tall, not too tall for pairs necessarily, but you know, not a ton of partners there, although she's been skating in Colorado apparently and you know testing that out or you know different environments to see different guys that are available. There aren't a ton of boys out there right now. I know Balaj Nagy was looking for a partner. Um, people have said he has found someone potentially. There's a Blake Eisenbach, but there's not a ton of guys out there unless Danny O'Shea, you know, switches ranks or something, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that Gabby to me is someone that has the grit to do pairs and the drive. I just wonder who's out there for her. Yeah. Yeah. Or people come out of the woodwork or they come off the cruise ship or they do that. So yeah, I don't know. It's, I, I hope, you know, her success, because I think she has the right personality for it. I think it comes down to injuries and she's had a lot of shoulder surgeries, but. Well, and that was one of the, just to circle back to the Boyko Kozlovsky interview when they were saying, he was admitting, he was like, well, don't you think all pair girls have to be crazy mm -hmm. to even like attempt being thrown in the air and like, just doing all these rotations and landing. And I think it does take a character type. Yeah. A, a real daredevil type to do that. Yes. That's why I always thought actually Truseva probably could have done it. She has that like, go for it, no holds barred kind of approach to skating. I mean, she'd be trying to throw quad axles in no time. I'm sure of it. Yeah. For sure. And there, I was reading an article this week that um, the younger Gilina sister, uh, not Veronica Gilina, but Alyona Gilina, was originally pegged for pairs. Uh, they were originally with a Terry and their mother wanted to be on the staff and that was a no-go. So they moved to Plushenka, but they've gotten better jump technique out of the deal. They have more of that niche and jump. And we were seeing quads from, Alyona was doing quad toe and quad sow and Veronica doing quad lots and jumps that look more sustainable than we've seen from the yes. team the camp. Um, Alyona has not had success in competition yet, but some skaters develop later or do better with a partner. So I'm intrigued, but you know, Terry has not had the best year. That's another thing of her building pairs. It's almost a distraction because she hasn't had the same level of dominance through the ranks. She has had two top, or, and with Valieva, you know, three top single skaters, but not the same level of acclaim and, and dominance. So What's interesting, um, you know, Plushenka has really made ground on the uh, singles. And then the other thing is that Eteri show didn't sell well this year, and that hasn't been covered everywhere, but um, her tickets were more expensive and there are so many Russian ice shows and without the international competition, skating is not as big as it was a year ago or two years ago in Russia. And this show was overpriced potentially and without the same kind of acclaim and star power she didn't have as big of a year going on yeah um, and that's you know something that Russian journalists have been talking about um and what is her investment and 
what is going to happen with Diana and Gleb? You know, I think it's so interesting that uh, Terry thrives on competition with everyone, but they're really, besides Lorraine, um, you know, Carpenter, they're really the only top team, you know, in their environment. So I just wonder what is going to happen there and why are they still in Virginia and what is going on with uh, Terry's team, you know, with Diana. Yeah. At the, um, we do see Annabelle um, with Igor, her partner, Igor Aramenko. You know, they've made their free dance already. They're skating to Wicked Game. Um, I think we know that Diana is going to be doing some Michael Jackson program. So I think we'll see what's happening going forward. But what do you think of the new music so far for the 80s? Are you into this or not? You know, the Korean team is actually going to do Prince, but we don't know which songs. And I think... Yes, we saw that Tessa and Scott did Purple Rain. I think it's interesting that Marie France is making another Prince program, but we don't know that it's going to be the same songs. I and would if, assume it would be different. Yeah. If I were them, I would do Raspberry Beret. Okay. I would do, right? I, that's what I would do. Do something. Doesn't that also sound like it could have been the name of a Taller Cranston special? Yes. <laughs> but honestly, like there's so many songs and teams are going to be doing something obvious which is annoying to yes. us the viewer, and everyone else. And if you want to do Tina Turner, I would do typical male. Like I would take something that was a hit, but not Purple Rain, right? And do although, although and it, it, or you can take a page out of the book of Galyamov and do simply the best. Yes. And that's sending the message to your music that you are designed to win. I would imagine we're going to get a lot of Madonna, a lot of Michael Jackson. That's right. a you, but if I were doing Michael Jackson, I wouldn't pick Billie Jean. I would go Dirty right. Diana. I would go Smooth Criminal, Dirty Diana, Pretty Young Thing. Like I would do songs that people love and that they can fall in love with again and not something that everyone is gonna be like, Ugh. yes, it's great. We've heard it a million times. Are there any ice dancers that often lip sync their music while they're skating? You know how some of the single skaters will do that? If there mm. is, I think they should do Millie Vanilli. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> But I mean, um, yeah, you get Tim Coletto and he's doing Ghostbusters, and that could go either way. You either have to camp it up and do that so well, you'd or you have to lean in. You'd have to lean in, yeah. To lean in, I'm nervous about that one. Uh, the Ghostbusters yes. made me very concerned. Of if, all the it oh, will help me if if like she dresses in a green dress and he's trying to like extinguish her the whole rhythm dance. This could go a uh, a whole lot of wrong ways, or it could be it could be fun and kitschy. I would think that the the team in Montreal is holding out to give their sassiest, most show stopping eighties number to Lila and Lewis. That they, they will be the team. I'm intrigued to see what they have chosen for the rhythm. Well, that's interesting because, you know, they did do Madonna, but they did more of the recognizable Madonna, right? I think wow. for them, they need to go popular artist, unexpected song, right? Okay. That's, yeah. You know, to me, like, that's fashion, right? Like, that's like, that's how you get the great idea, is right. like do something a little unexpected. Um, Accessible, but different. Yeah, 100%. Um. It's so funny, I skate with young team and the boy wanted to do a K-pop program. And I said, yeah, you should do it. You should. Like, you should, that's different, right? If you do it well, thousand percent. It, you wanna talk it. about clickbait? The minute you do that program and it's up on YouTube, it will explode regardless what of- What part is Jun Wa Cha gonna do a, a K-pop program? I think either for a short or an exhibition, Boom, he is the right skater with the right look at the right time. Yeah. And I think he's popular enough, lean in, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think, because I, I criticized his Michael Jackson, not that he did Michael, but that it was the expected song. And someone said, well, you were okay when Shoma did Earth Song. And it's like, because Earth Song isn't Billie Jean or Thriller, right? Yeah. It's not well, the expected. Although what I liked about the music edits they chose for his Michael Jackson is it started with that massive orchestral introduction. So at first you don't even know it's going there. That part I enjoyed very much, like the sort of the cinematic opening that you know something's building up to that amazing quad sal and then burst into it. So I was appreciative that the opening didn't automatically hit you on the head with the familiar. I think, listen, I actually would want to pick 
Tina Turner, for Olivia Smart, but not what they did before. Because again, so expected, Tina, right? right? But right. I would be like, it's typical. Dun, 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 dun. Come on. She hey. has the legs for it. She can <laughs> do it. Okay. This is, you, they, know. you have to, oh, what's love got to do? Come on. She got can do it. She's old enough. Lila could never pull that off. Like it's sexy, it's interesting, she's older. Like there are so many great things if you don't pick the expected choice. Yeah, here's my thing. As we talk about like when young skaters have done inappropriate music, I can guarantee you we're gonna have to have the talk some season or at some point next season when there's like a junior ice dance team doing private dancer. I can guarantee sure. it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Just like, hey, big spender or whatever other like- That's why we have Marie Franz. We could do private dancer. Olivia would be great. Mash that up with what's love got to do with it. We've got a rhythm dance, okay? Like, <laughs> let's do it. Uh, I'm on board. And those are two great songs that we haven't heard in pop culture just a thousand times over the last decades. I'm sorry, the Prince program, if Hannah Lim is doing Raspberry Beret, I am on board. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to hear Kiss and I don't want to hear um, Purple Rain because Tessa and Scott did that. But I would imagine it's going to be tricky, like to make sure they fall within the rules. So is it that the song had to be released in the 80s? Is it that we are waiting for Sean Redstat to release the rules? He, because you know, that, have... can, I can see a situation where people are accidentally taking an artist that was famous in the 80s, but not a song that was from the 80s or. I think there's, it's going to be a lot of mm, gray and area. Our Canadian junior team uh, from the junior worlds had their song come out. And it's so funny is because people forget which songs are from the eighties because everything is, you know, and it, is it a song with a cover, right? There are so many different right. uh, ways to interpret the eighties. Yeah. But I mean, work at nine to five, someone can give us a work at nine to five program. How about it give me a 9.5? <laughs> okay. I don't know. Like, to me, that would be, I mean, I love Dolly, but I don't know. That, no, of course they should. Sure. I don't know why that gives, like, I just, ugh, right? So it's, it's like, let's do a Cats program. Let's do Phantom of the Opera, right? Typically 80s. Do you, I mean, so that's why, again, I think further, further clarification, because as we've talked, obviously there's all the, the classical music that came out in the eighties, all of the musical theater, practically everyone skates to eighties musical theater when they skate to musical theater. Um, it, it will be very interesting as a choreographer, I would want to do the creative choice, but I think those rules would be crucial in, in helping guide that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they want I skate with a team that skates to Footloose and it's a lot of fun. I mean, the kids don't have the reference, so they're right. learning. Yeah, it's not tired to them. It's fresh and exciting. Like, what's this cool piece? And you're like, yeah, yeah, Max Aram. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but we do see Nadia Bashinska and Peter Beaumont are doing Never Tear Us Apart by INXS and by INXS, sorry. In yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Hey. And an extra small. Wild Buyers by Duran Duran. Um, With all the like all the Cleopatra programs, you know, someone's gonna just make the misstep and do walk like an Egyptian. You know, we should do this for single skaters where we have to give them a decade so that we don't have every skater from Korea doing a program that Yuna did. All right, this could be <laughs> or every American skater doing some sort of sad, weepy singer-songwriter ballad from the mid two thousands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or they should do like this year. You can't skate to in this shirt. That could be like a rule by the. <laughs> Anything but, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's Phantom Carmen in the shirt. Right. Carmen, or are you Carmen? Uh, Phantom has closed on Broadway. Please don't respond <laughs> with a skating program. Yeah. Also this week, we saw that Donovan Carrillo did a triple axel again after four months off the ice. We uh -huh. had, and we were talking about the problems in the Hungarian uh, Figure Skating Federation last week. Gergen is now gone. So lots of things moving parts we said this week so and but yeah. back to your triple axel discussion it was interesting to read that um hey and lee article mm -hmm. uh about her working on the triple axel and did you 
Did I read that she's going back to her old program? That might have been from a fake account. You know, there's starting to be an account on Twitter that's mimicking the it's other. Amazing. OK. But if she is doing it, I would love it. But I don't know. But she's definitely been training the triple axe. We saw her land it last summer. She was right. practicing at the World Team Trophy, uh, perhaps not fully, fully rotated. It's in progress. Yeah. It's possible, but in progress. Yeah. So I'm ready. And then we saw that NBC and Twitter are teaming up for the Olympics, which comes up to how they are distributing content. Well, it could be genius because the Olympics are not just profitable in this world where you're gonna sit down at 8 p.m., right? It's in real right. time. <laughs> Who does that? Yeah. Right? And it's changed. So maybe this is brilliant to make the Olympics more relevant, to put it on Twitter instead of blocking coverage. That would and be- And what would that mean to put it on Twitter? I don't know, there's gonna be some show, maybe clips, maybe lot, like, I don't know what that means. They just Twitter. won't be shutting everything down on Twitter, maybe. Yeah, but they're trying to engage a social media platform and, and do this. I mean, I think it expands for the future of the Olympics. I mean, they have to change, right? Not everyone is just gonna buy Peacock. So maybe this is a funnel way in, but it's a move forward in, to keep the Olympics relevant. Uh, yeah. And again, so, it's become a culture that consumes that kind of media when they feel like it. Mm -hmm. It's not, we're sitting down for prime time and we're just gonna watch whatever you give us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just not that culture anymore. So, so I think the idea of having it accessible on your own time and whatever you wanna watch would be so ideal. And the Olympic coverage was messy on mm -hmm. Peacock. It was trying to find it and trying to figure this out and rah, 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 rah. So, I'm just intrigued how it would work on Twitter. I'm as intrigued as anyone else. And I wish they had like hooked up with YouTube or something like that. That might be a little too, yeah, who knows what would yeah. happen there. But with Twitter, interesting. And maybe because they want people to be conversing about it, you know, we're mm -hmm. a little bit engagement. in that engagement. But I think it's, you know, Twitter or YouTube or Facebook are really their options, right? And that goes into the accessibility of skating on Peacock now and why is it not as accessible? We see Dancing with the Stars was on Disney Plus. It's moving back to Disney. Then they have the, the moving back to ABC. Then we have the writer strike going on. So there's going to be a need for content, at right. least if it, in the short term. Who knows how much it will really impact things. Depends how long it goes on for. So yeah lot of opportunity for sports to have more exposure and if you choose to take the opportunity to grow and move forward or dig in your heels and kind of keep it the same and just watch it slowly die the blockbuster mom yeah yes so yeah. we will see but i think it, lots of interesting things happen and Lots happened. So uh, yeah, who knew Bukova was going to be switching and entertaining us there? But I'm so ready for Moskvina to go against Terry because I think I think Terry may win the early competitions, but I want to see the nationals. And listen, yeah. if Russia is allowed back for Worlds next year and they have one team, Boykova against Mishina, that whether you are pro-Russia back or not, I would be fascinated to watch them battle it out to see which team got to go. Yeah, 100%. But it was interesting because also the, the thing I didn't mention earlier when we were talking to Elena was when they say, oh, well, it's stagnated. Why are we doing all the same elements? And then I could hear a Megan Duhamel in my ear being like, because your federation wouldn't let us. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it was the Russian federation that put a halt to all of that development. Because they weren't doing the elements then. That's the turning. That's it yeah. benefit them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like people were trying. They were going there, and then it just was told to stop. But and, and Sui and Han won anyway. Yeah. Because remember, and, they had the quad twist and the quad throw Sauco, and they won anyway. Right. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. It did stagnate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 